Good morning. I welcome you as we are gathered once again by God's Holy Spirit to sing our hosannas to Jesus our Lord, uh, to Jesus for uh, bearing the consequences of all of our sins so that we can stand before God in his righteousness. If you're visiting, if you're first time worshipers, we extend warm welcomes. We are so glad you are here to join us in this worship. Uh, I ask a favor. There is a visitor registration card, or there should be, in the pew rack. Would you please fill that out and then place it in the offering plate when it comes by? We would appreciate that. Um, I remind everybody there are black registration pads somewhere in the pew. Uh, you may register your attendance there. You also may register your participation in Holy Communion by checking a little box there, or you can use a communion card. Our order of service is the green bulletin. We'll just follow as printed there. Uh, we'd like to thank both our choirs for the special music they are providing on this Palm Sunday. Um, after, uh, speaking of special music, after the families have come forward and received Holy Communion, we're asking for the preschoolers through third grade to actually exit the sanctuary, go through the double doors and down the hall uh, into the fellowship hall, into Luther Hall. They will be gathering there at that time after communion uh, to prepare for their singing. So they get to stay with the family um, until then. Uh, you might also notice that's sort of our uh, um, wishes and desires in our worship service is that the whole families worship and participate together. We don't split you up. We don't have just the adults up here and send the kids somewhere else. We like to uh, have families do worship together. So. Through communion, you'll be together, and then we'll send the kids down for their singing part. Uh, speaking of Holy Communion, uh, today we will be celebrating Holy Communion, and we come forward to receive bread and wine. But we believe that in, with, and under the bread and the wine is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also believe that we receive what is promised, which is the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, if you are baptized, if you so believe, you're welcome to partake in communion. Uh, we'll be doing so in a continuous fashion on the sanctuary floor. So if you come at center aisle and then you can return by your respective side aisles, we do one side and then the other. Uh, announcements, I've talked so much about worship today. Uh, the yellow sheets are there for you to read. Uh, there is one extra announcement did not get into our bulletin, and that is the uh, sad news that Beulah Van Bakken did pass away uh, yesterday morning. Uh, her funeral is scheduled for next Saturday at uh, 2 p.m. And so uh, we ask your prayers for all of her family in this time of grief. Uh, finally, happy birthday. Uh, Lindsay Olson is celebrating her birthday along with a Kyle Brewer celebrating his birthday. So uh, happy birthday to them. Uh, I should end with my uh, sort of shifting to something uh, uh, more of a joke fashion, and this one concerns the uh, law enforcement. So they have to have law enforcement thing. Uh, the Highway Patrol recently uh, ended up stopping Larry the Cable Guy. He was in South Dakota and he was driving, and they stopped him. And of course, the uh, Highway Patrolman, as he comes to the car, says, have you got any ID? And uh, Larry the Cable Guy and his southern dog goes, about what? Story number two, uh, a female with a lighter hair complexion uh, called the police. She said, somebody just stole my husband's pickup. And they said, well, did you see who it was? She goes, no, but I got his license number. <laughs> with that, please stand, greet one another, welcome one another.
I invite you to remain standing as you are able. As it is Palm Sunday, we begin with our processional gospel, which is from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that they are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The processional gospel. We continue with the singing of our processional hymn.
You may be seated. I invite you to turn to page 73 for the service of Holy Communion. We are gathered in the name of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sin to God our Father, imploring him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Most merciful God, you have given your only Son to die for us. Have mercy on us and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. By your Holy Spirit, increase in us to knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, so that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To all who believe in his name, he gives power to become the children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. All who believe and are baptized will be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we confess that we have fallen for many temptations. Thank you for not giving up on us. Help us to recognize the places in our lives that need correction and give us a spirit of repentance so that we would not bear the continued consequences of sin. We pray in the mercy of your Son, Jesus, trusting that you are always with us. Amen. Our senior choir will have their anthem at this time.
The first lesson for this Sunday, we read from the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter. This comes from the middle of what we call the Ten Commandments, and it will be coming at the end of the first commandment. I read from verse 5. You shall not bow down to these idols or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. That ends the reading. The second reading comes from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, his first one. It is from the 10th chapter, and Paul is reminding the Corinthians that there are always consequences uh, to our turning away from God. From verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized in the Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of, some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That ends our reading. I invite you to turn to our Lenten sentence, which is on page 78, and stand as we sing together. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Continuing the theme of consequences, we read a parable from Jesus of the consequences of who you build your life upon. From verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The Gospel of our Lord.
You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward for a children's message. man and my little man is going to be standing among the commandments of God and these are going to be the commandments of God the first commandment second the third commandment uh, boy if I can do this this is going to be amazing third commandment fourth commandment the fifth commandment the sixth commandment the seventh commandment, the eighth, ninth, tenth. Okay, we got the ten commandments there. Now, my little man is going to, let's see if he can do this, he's going to break one of the commandments. You ready? We're going to watch what happens. Let's see if this is going to work. He's going to break this commandment. Oh, and they broke him. Now, what if, again, we'll have all the commandments here, but now we have a big domino that will be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it is going to be standing next to my little man. So, but now, when he breaks these commandments... We're going to find out. You think so? You think that's going to happen? Let's see if I can get this set up right. This is, this is the only fun thing I ever found to do with dominoes. Except for playing 42. Yeah, that's funny. It is sort of funny. 42 is a game out of a, a card game. Okay, ready? He's ready. He's got to break one of the commandments. And, oh, but... What protected him from the breaking of the commandments so the commandments wouldn't break him? The big, the big one that was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is God. And that is our lesson today about there are always consequences to breaking the commandments. However, Jesus Christ, sent by God the Father through the Holy Spirit, is the one who protects us even when we break the commandments. Suddenly everybody's excited. What are we excited about? Huh? Candy! Is it candy time? Okay. Well, thanks for coming up. And here's some candy. Can everybody find a piece? Everybody get a piece? A piece? Oh. Everybody get one? You get what you needed? Okay. Which one do you want? Okay. Did you get one? Okay.
Grace, mercy, peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord, from our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Consequences for every action or inaction, there is a consequence. Either it will be a positive consequence or it will be a negative consequence. But there will be consequences to all we do or fail to do. Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, everyone knew there would be consequences. At first, it appeared as if the consequences would be good and favorable for Jesus and his disciples. I mean, the crowd excited by and caught up in the further con uh, that uh, surrounded his raising of Lazarus from the dead. <clears throat> the crowd is jubilant. They are greeting him like a conquering hero. They are calling him king. However, as so often occurs, the pendulum swings the other way. Public opinion quickly shifted so that before the week was out, that same crowd would change their tune from Hosanna to crucify him. For the authorities that are in earthly power, the consequences of Jesus being hailed as king, well, <coughs> that was too much. That could not be tolerated. What would Rome do? Fearing the consequences of that, a decision is made. It is better for one man to die than for an entire nation to perish. Yet despite knowing the consequences, knowing that the crowd would turn on him, that they would be shouting crucify him, still Jesus enters Jerusalem in order to face the consequences. Why would he do that? So that we will not have to face the consequences. What consequences do we face? We face the consequences of our being born into sin. The consequences of our sin, which is death. Romans 6.23 What do you mean we're born into sin? Well, we just finished an entire series going through the Ten Commandments this Lent. And after six weeks of hearing God's word of law addressed to us, the one thing we can be assured of is that we are sinful and unclean and that we cannot not be sinful and unclean. While it is true that apart from God's word, when we don't have God's word of law speaking into our ear, we can falsely imagine ourselves to just all be, well, okay. But when we hear God's word of law, when it acts upon us, when we hear Jesus saying, you have heard it is said, but I say to you, and then we discover that, well, we break the fifth commandment when we're angry. We break the sixth commandment when we look at another. Uh, after God has spoken, we are unable to speak of our innocence, which makes the conclusion to the commandments which is really today's text topic. We're wrapping up our uh, series on the Ten Commandments here by looking at what in the catechism is called the conclusion. And this is actually page 10 in the front part of your reclaimed hymnals. You'll see that at the end, it has what is called the conclusion. It actually comes from the Exodus 20 passage. It comes from the first commandment. But as we learned, all the commandments are really just one big circle. I was even showing that in the children's uh, sermon in which the dominoes are lined up, the commandments are lined up in a circle. And so uh, here in the first commandment, we hear what really applies to all the commandments. And we hear something very, very frightening. What we hear? I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. If you want to talk about consequences that await, well, there are consequences that await those who do not fear, love, and trust the Lord God. And these consequences are going to go down generations. Of course, none of this 
seems very fair. But who said life is fair? But shouldn't God at least be fair? Actually, thank God that he's not fair. If God were fair, we would not stand a chance. For as we have learned in the study of our commandments, all the commandments derive, go back to that first commandment, uh, when I engage in some juicy gossip, when I desire, well, the nice house of my neighbor, it is because I do not fear, love, and trust my God. And if I do not love God, well, what's the opposite of love? If I don't love God, I hate God. To those who hate me, the iniquities are visited down to the third and fourth generation. So when I scheme to find ways to take advantage of foolish people, I'm hating God. And deserve the consequences of my sin. The consequences that will go down to my great, great, whatever, grandchildren, whatever it is. Uh, why should my grandchildren bear the consequences of my sin? Again, doesn't seem rather fair. But actually, everybody does. We all bear the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. It is because of Adam and Eve's sin that we're all born into sin. We are born not trusting God. We do not take God at his word. We replicate the original sin all over. We just disbelieve God. Which is why it is so good that we have a jealous God. Why is it good to have a jealous God? We think jealousy is bad. I mean, if you polled the population and say, what do you want, a jealous God? Everybody go, no, we don't want a jealous God. We want a kind and loving God. We want an affirming, a supportive God. We want a God who just winks at us and says, no problem, whenever we break a commandment. We want a God who is in touch with what we want and desire, uh, a God in step with culture, a proponent of justice and equality, a builder of bridges between communities, etc., etc., etc. But the one thing we don't want and could probably agree on, we don't want a jealous God. And we will not tolerate such a God. In fact, we will create the God of our desires. But there are consequences to this selective filtering we do in order to find a God that is pleasing to us. The consequences Jesus points out in his parable about those who hear my word versus those who don't. The consequence is our death and destruction. We just get wiped away in the flood. God's consequences for hating God is attached to the first commandment. The commandment, you will not have any other gods. That is precisely because God knows that this is what we will do continually. Every time we find something about the God who reveals himself to us that we don't like, well, we just go off and we suddenly make idols all around us. We jump off this bandwagon of God and we jump on, well, making other idols. Today, it is probably easier than ever to find idols. We, we don't even have to go and carve something out of wood or stone. All we have to do uh, is when we find something in God and we say, you know, I don't like what God's revealing about himself and it just doesn't sort of fit my fancy, we rush off and go shopping. We go shopping among the myriad of spiritual factories that are churning out all sorts of things on internet sites or uh, have we go attend some uh, spiritual pep rally at a giant coliseum uh, in which the God that we want to hear is proclaimed. But the God, 
Yahweh, which means I am who I am, and I'm not going to change. Uh, he doesn't tolerate rivals. Period. He will not let his chosen run off and love another. He is jealous. Our jealous God will not share us with anyone or anything else. Our jealous God is not going to wink and tolerate any sin from us. Therefore, it is our jealous God who will see that all the dire consequences of our sinful behavior will be felt and experienced, that our iniquities will be visited upon us. This is what jealous gods do. And for that, we give thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm going back to this always. For if our God were not a jealous God, he would not pursue us. He would not chase after us as we wander down another path of rebellion and disbelief. A non-jealous God would just say, good riddance, goodbye. But our God is a jealous God who pursues those whom he has come into a relationship by his promises and he will not let us go. Therefore, it is a jealous God who sends Jesus into Jerusalem, knowing full well the consequences. In fact, he sends him into Jerusalem to actually bear the consequences. Jesus bears the consequences of our rejecting a God who doesn't fit our expectations. I mean, notice what happens. He enters Jerusalem and everybody's going, Hosanna, because they think he's going to fulfill their expectations. And when he doesn't, what do they say? Crucify him. It's the same thing we say. This is us in the scriptures. And Jesus comes to purposefully bear the consequences of our disbelief, of our disobedience. He does this by bearing the cross. He bears torture, ridicule, shame, and he bears our sin. The consequences of our sin. Our jealous God is so incensed that we might be led away by the evil one that he will take our sin, our death, our consequences so that we might be freed. Freed from sin, death, and the evil one. This is what a jealous God does. And he then puts us to death by his word of law so that we might be raised to new life, resurrected to a new life, that now we will believe, now we will trust. Instead of how we were from the very beginning created, and we did this through all the Ten Commandments, we go to every commandment and we said, and you will break this commandment, and you will break this commandment, and you will break that commandment. Now suddenly God is about creating new creatures new beings, born again, so that we will believe, we will trust, and we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our, all our, heart, all our soul, all our mind, and our neighbor as ourself. This, by the way, is what a jealous God does. He shows us the full consequences of our bondage, our attraction to sin, in order to repent us, to turn us back to him where therefore in him we will be made anew to be made a believer, to be made one who actually trusts in God and one who actually lives with God, for God, forever. The rebellious self that is our natural state is put to death by God's word so that a new self can arise that will love God with all our heart, soul, mind. A jealous God puts an end to the unfaithfulness of us always rushing off, always inevitably breaking every commandment we can find, and he says, enough. He will raise up a new you, a new being. This is the end of the cycle. This is the end of always having to find that the law is saying, we are dead, we are doomed. 
that it will go on this way forever through generation to generation to generation and God puts an end to it. This is that brick right there at the end saying, no, this doesn't touch you because I have made you a new creation by putting an end to you, the old you, to raise up a new you that now is actually going to believe, that is actually now going to be faithful, a new you that will actually be new as you hear and live in his word. Jesus' parable, two houses built, one upon those who hear God's word and gladly learn it and live in it, the rock, the word, Jesus himself, and those who don't. Uh, for those who don't, the jealous God will make sure you will hear and be turned back to him. A jealous God says, everybody I have made a promise to, you're mine. And I will make sure, I will pursue, I will always see that you are mine. I will not let you run the other way. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Amen. Our worship continues with our offering. As we collect our offering, we'll collect the offering, I guess. Thought we had a song there, but we don't.
As we contemplate the mighty acts of God that has won our salvation, let us turn to him uh, with prayers for his church, for the world, for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, as we gather this day in peace and quietness, we are aware of our many brothers and sisters in Christ who bear his cross in a world and suffer persecution for their faith. Sustain them by your mighty spirit, and let the blood of the martyrs truly be the seed of your church. Lord, in your mercy. Let the cross of Christ be our source of hope and power. May we never be ashamed of the foolishness of Christ crucified. May we boldly proclaim the cross as your wisdom and righteousness, that many will experience its life-giving power. Lord, in your mercy. Teach the nations the way of peace and justice and humble service. Let Jesus always be lifted up to draw all nations to himself. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our North American Lutheran Church, for Bishop Brodowski, for all pastors, teachers, leaders, for all the faithful who gather around the crucified and risen Lord as he teaches us through the scriptures and feeds us with the bread of life. Lord, in your mercy. For the leaders of this nation and our community, for all who give of themselves that we may enjoy health and safety and security, Lord, in your mercy. For the needs of which we are aware and for the needs that are known only to you, we pray, Lord. We pray especially for the family of Beulah Van Bakken as they uh, reflect on the gift that she has been to them in her life and as they bear the loss of that gift. We pray that you will unite us with all of those who now sleep in your presence and raise us with them to share in your eternal Easter festival. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. It is into your hands, Father, that we command all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with our service of Holy Communion. It is found on page 85 in the front part of your hymnals. Brothers and sisters in Christ, to receive the Holy Sacrament in a worthy manner, consider what we must now believe and do. We should believe that Jesus Christ himself is truly present in the bread and wine as his words declare. This is my body which is given for you, this is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. We should also trust that Jesus Christ forgives our sins as his words promise for the forgiveness of sins. Finally, we should do as Christ commands when he says, take, eat, drink, do this in remembrance of me. When we repent, believe these words and do as Christ commands, then we have rightly examined ourselves and may worthily come to the Lord's table for the forgiveness of our sins. Together, we should also give thanks to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for this great gift. We should love one another with a pure heart and with the whole Christian church, take comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. May our Heavenly Father grant us his grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, who on the tree of the cross gave salvation to humankind so when death arose, life might also rise again, and that the serpent who by a tree once overcame might likewise by a tree be overcome. Through Christ our Lord, therefore with angels 
and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood, shed for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We continue with our receiving of our communion.
Please stand to receive our blessing and benediction. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which you have just received, may it strengthen you, may it preserve you in true faith. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this, your salutary gift. And we ask that in your mercy to strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. This we pray through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the special music from our preschool through third grade choir. <laughs> <laughs> 